geochemistry professor here at Montana Tech. And uh, she uh, has the distinction of actually having a bachelor's degree in geology, and they still hire her in chemistry. <laughs> That's how bad she is. <laughs> Um, so, the, Alicia uh, came to us from Arizona State in Tempe, where she was doing a postdoc, and that's also where she did the bachelor's degree, coincidentally. Prior to that, she, went, she did a postdoc in Zurich at the Einigen Technische Hochschule, which is, you know, like yeah. Einstein's. Uh, the Swiss like to claim Einstein. Yeah. They, they like to claim Einstein yeah, around there. Yeah. Especially yep. at she did a doctorate at MIT and Woods Hole in chemical oceanography, so she's a well-rounded person to have to And she's got great talks, so I'm just... <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about environmental dynamics and geobiochemical engineering from supervolcanoes to Silverbow Creek. Quick story, uh, we named ourselves the Edge Lab and then I realized that a colleague of mine was the Edge Lab, so we're now legend. So the laboratory exploring geobiochemical engineering and natural dynamics. So look out for that. And uh, uh, I'm going to be giving this talk, but it is the result of the work of all of the students in my lab so far, including Renee, Georgia, Jordan, and Mackenzie, who have been working with me this past year uh, in the lab. So here are Renee and Georgia uh, next to a spring in Yellowstone, sampling, um, taking meter readings and sampling this spring. Uh, here we are standing out with Joe Griffin uh, looking at some hydrodynamic devices that have been in the ground, and here's sampling uh, Silver Boat Creek. And this is our lab crest, which Renee designed, and it'll end up being colored and get rather large as well. All right, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, a broad variety of things that we do in our lab, and it's all connected to what's happening in the environment. We do work at Yellowstone, which is a super volcano, as well as uh, the surface waters here around Butte, including Silver Bow Creek and Blacktail Creek, and all the way through the upper Clark Fork, kind of down to Drummond, we have a project there. So here you'll see sampling in the winter down in Upper Silver Bow Creek, uh, right there. We also do work in the mines. Uh, Renee is working in getting samples from the flooded mine shafts in Butte. Here we are down Orphan Boy and Orphan Girl sampling. And we sample with the Bureau uh, around town to get data and microbial data as well. And we also have a project with Robert Pell, and this is Mackenzie and Jeremy. We had a summer research project where we are looking to uh, help with phytoremediation using native plants and uptake of metals. So we started a project with that. So we're very interested in what's happening around town in the soils. Okay, so what is geobiochemistry? You probably heard biogeochemistry, which is when you're thinking about elements and kind of following them around in environmental systems. Well, geobiochemistry is thinking about the geology of a place and what does that mean for the chemistry and what are the organisms doing in order to live in that location. So that's geobiochemistry. We're going to use zinc here. Here's a zinc ion, zinc 2 plus, as an example. And then here it is in the environment and here is an organism, a microorganism. And how is it interacting with this zinc? Well, it can take up the zinc depending on whether or not the zinc is bioavailable to it, and it can use it in protein. So this is a protein that we found in a Yellowstone hot spring and modeled it using Swiss Pro, and it also uses zinc. So the link between the environment, the rocks, the water-rock interaction producing uh, chemistry, and a organism is in its proteins. So proteins represent what reactions can be happening in an organism. So, We've got zinc, it's bioavailable, it goes into the organism, and the organism uses this in some form in itself. But bioavailability is key. So here's a, a little bit of a primer on uh, words that you might see tossed about uh, in the literature as well. So this is the central dogma of biology. Biologists are familiar. We have DNA, makes RNA, makes our protein. And this happens um, in your cells, this happens in all organisms. And when you see an organism in culture, and you take it and you extract its DNA, you get a genome. And if you take an organism in culture and you extract its um, RNA, you get a transcriptome. So it is in the process of making the blueprint 
of what's in its DNA into a protein. And if you took an organism in culture and extracted it for proteins, you would get a proteum. Um, and that's all very well and controlled and in a laboratory experiment. You'll also see these words thrown around, metagenome, metatranscriptome, metaproteome. And what do we mean by that? Well, we mean we go to the environment, we take a scoop of something, like dirt, or we filter the water, and then we extract the DNA and the, the RNA and the metaproteome. We as scientists are good at doing this now, extracting DNA from environmental samples. We can do that. Uh, people are getting good at this too, metatranscriptomes. It's very difficult, we don't, we don't do that. Metaproteome, this is also difficult, but we do work on this. And so what the metaproteome is telling us is what is happening with that organism in that environment at that time that we extracted the sample. So to sum it down, you think about DNA as metabolic potential. What could happen in that environment with given that set of DNA? Um, proteins being made, metatranscriptome, we have this blueprint, we're making some proteins that are going to form reactions. And then we have the proteins present in terms of the metaproteome. So we can use this as metabolic activity. If they made this protein, they're probably using it and performing that reaction that that protein or that enzyme catalyzes, and then also with uh, metatranscriptome. But in terms of DNA in the environment, a metagenome, metabolic potential, that kind of tells us a little bit of something about ecosystem health. Are those organisms there the ones that we expect to be there? And that is what we're working on um, with Silver Bow Creek, Blacktail Creek, and all the way through the Upper Clark Dwarf. Is the system healthy down to the microbes? Okay. All right, so how do we characterize the water environment? So we go out into the environment and we're like, okay, what is happening? Um, you need to be a chemist, you need to be a biologist, you need to be a geologist to understand what's actually happening in the environment. And so here we have Renee, she is sampling using the hydro lab over here at this time, and she is measuring uh, in situ dissolved oxygen, pH, conductivity, and temperature. And we get those measurements right away when we go on to the field, so we know what's happening. Uh, there are some species that are reactive that we need to measure while we're out there, and we do that by spectrophotometry in the field. So these are just wet chemical tests that we use to get dissolved silica, iron, total, total dissolved sulfide. Uh, these species are very important and um, are most interesting uh, in hot springs. So uh, the hydrothermal system, we'll talk a little bit about the supervolcano soon. The hot water dissolves the rock and they have high silica when they come out. Um, they're super saturated and then they precipitate out the sinter that you see in hot springs. Uh, iron two and total dissolved sulfide. So we measure those out in the field. This is Mackenzie here um, doing spectrophotometry out of the back of the, truck, back of the truck uh, down at Nine Mile Creek. Uh, so we can't do everything in the field. So we have to take some uh, samples back to the lab. And so we filter our water and we collect for major cations, anions, trace elements, dissolved inorganic carbon, dissolved organic carbon, um, oxygen and deuterium isotopes in water as well as organic acids. And so from all these measurements, we can characterize the system and we can actually do uh, calculations as to what energy would be available, what sort of reactions we would expect to be happening in this place at this time that we collected. So here we have Renee and Jordan collecting a sample down in German Gulch. Here's Jordan filtering a sample. Also, it looks like Nine Mile. Okay, but we want to tie all this geochemistry to the microbial activity because we can't just ignore the microbes because they're there in the system. So we have to consider them too. And so we collect sediment as well as filtered water and we extract protein and DNA from them and we will try to grow stuff, culture them, as well as try to figure out about how many cells are there at any given time. Okay. And this is my environmental chemistry class out at Yellowstone. Here they are learning how to do water chemistry in the field and here they're collecting samples for microbes here in the field. We're going out next weekend with the new environmental chemistry class. All right, so let's think about the environment. What do we have? So here's temperature on the x-axis, and here's pH on the y-axis. So I'm thinking about Earth here. So a little bit colder than zero, you know, and then we get superheated above boiling Celsius. pH values from zero all the way to 14. We might expect to see these conditions somewhere on Earth. And life on Earth, we've found all the way up to 122 Celsius. And this occurs with higher pressure, right? You can get the temperature to be higher. So like deep sea vents and 
down a hydrothermal system, a continental hydrothermal system, for example. And so we have a deep sea creature at 122 micro. Uh, the upper temperature or the upper uh, pH limit for life, this is a little bit more difficult. It's kind of a tenuous sort of line. People can find uh, waters like this naturally. Uh, but when people try to grow organisms like this in culture, it's very hard to keep the pH buffered. So that line is kind of um, unsure. Where is the upper limit for life in terms of basicity? Where are you? So you're here, uh, humans, hanging out at about 37 Celsius. Your blood is like 7.2-ish. And your stomach. You can find your stomach down here, hydrochloric acid in your stomach, pH of 2. Okay, so now we're kind of grounded in our space. Uh, this is the ocean here. The entire ocean kind of ranges, you know, from cold to a little bit warm. pH value doesn't have a very wide range. So 8.2 is the pH for the ocean. We've reached the carbonate buffering capacity of the ocean with all our CO2 burning, and that's another story. But there's the ocean. So some other places that I've looked at are acid mine drainage in Arizona. So we have um, acid reactions here and well as water nearby, covering more range. Swiss Alpine lakes, when I was in Switzerland, I've worked on these systems. And those are near neutral, right, uh, normal types of temperatures in the teens and down to zero. I've also worked on hot springs in Nevada, so these Great Basin hot springs going up to near boiling with a range of pH values. And Iceland, Icelandic springs, so we go all the way up to boiling. It's because Iceland is at sea level, so we go all the way up to 100. And then Iceland is basalt hosted, so we get higher pH values when we have water rock interaction in a basalt. And then Oman serpentinizing system. So this is one of the places that people are thinking about for origins of life uh, along these serpentinizing systems. And so you get these uh, you know, upper mantle rocks, the Oman ophiolite, and then the water comes through and interacts and comes out with a pH of 11 and a half, which is pretty, alpha, or pretty uh, basic. Uh, and this, this is the system that you would look at if you were kind of interested in this upper uh, basicity limit for where life is occurring. And Yellowstone. So Yellowstone is my favorite. Maybe I'm a little biased, right? So Yellowstone, you can find an environment in Yellowstone that represents almost anything that you're interested in, right? So say you want a particular iron to molybdenum ratio at a particular pH, we could probably find you a spring in Yellowstone that has those conditions. So that's kind of interesting. So this temperature pH space, it just represents chemistry, um, which is usually in n dimensions, right? So um, at any single one of these points, every single one of these is a point in the environment, um, you have all these different parameters that could occur at that place. Uh, so Yellowstone boiling is 92.5, so it goes up to here. And we don't get quite as basic as um, Iceland uh, because of the host rock that we have. All right, and then <clears throat> environments that I've looked at for trying to get proteins out of them to understand how those microbes are interacting with the geology, with the water chemistry. I've extracted proteins from a wide variety of environments like this. Okay, but what has legend done this year? So this year, since, um, so since last July, a couple of, well, Renee and Georgia came out to Yellowstone <coughs> um, right before I started. And um, then we started a bunch of projects this past year. And so this is kind of where we are so far in legend um, in our characterization of different environments uh, and our sampling. So we've uh, worked on Yellowstone, and there's some hot springs from the Azores. And these are the Butte flooded mines over here. And then this is Silver Bow Creek, as well as the uh, Silver Bow Blacktail Creek and the Upper Clark Fork you know, are all coming over here in a normal temperature and pH range. So every one of these points uh, has all of those values associated with it, or values that will be produced that we're working on uh, in order to characterize this environment and link it to microbial uh, identity and activity. Okay. So uh, temperature versus pH just represents a diverse geochemistry. So think about each of those points and say we looked at total dissolved zinc and total dissolved phosphorus, for example. So this is a log scale. So we're going order of magnitude along here as well as up, up here. And again, there's the ocean with its minor amount of variation. It covers 70% of the Earth's surface, but you know, minor amount of variation here. And Oman alkaline springs have a wide 
variety of zinc and phosphorus concentrations. And Iceland as well is varied, and Yellowstone as well. So if you're interested in a particular type of reaction, if you're wondering what's happening in a particular type of system, we can figure out one of those systems in order to figure out what is happening in that environment at that time. Okay. And also extracting proteins from these environments. All right, so Yellowstone is a super volcano. So this is one of my favorite locations. It's uh, near this really deeply sourced hot spring. We know this spring is deeply sourced from uh, radon measurements that our colleague of ours at University of Wyoming makes. And this hot spring, this mud pot, has changed dynamically. So it was over in one area, and now it has changed a little bit. I'll show a couple pictures of that uh, later. And the reason why this area seems to be so active is it is on the edge of the Sour Creek Dome. And you can actually correlate the pH of one of these springs in this area with the rising and falling um, of that resurgent dome in Yellowstone, which is actually really interesting. So there you have a direct link between geologic happenings and water chemistry in these springs. It's really cool. Uh, so here's the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. If you haven't checked out the May 2016 National Geographic article, um, Joe gave me a copy of it, it's awesome. Uh, the, whole, uh, article, the whole thing is about uh, Yellowstone. And so we have the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem and we're outside of the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. And the, you know, we have elk and bear and all the charismatic macrofauna that one can study in this area, um, as well as the edge of the caldera in Yellowstone. And then the resurgent domes are right here, the Sour Creek Dome, and then the Mallard Lake Dome is like over here. Okay, so check out that National Geographic uh, article if you're interested in this. It has all sorts of uh, issue, uh, societal issues uh, dealing with managing this area as an ecosystem. Okay. But this is why Yellowstone is awesome, I think. So here is the plume modeled. We have down to the inner core, all the way up uh, to the, the mantle here, and there's a hot spot underneath Yellowstone. And so this is where we're getting all of our deep volcanic activity from this hot spot that is underneath Yellowstone hydrothermal system. Here's a zoom in of that. So this is an artist's rendition of what this might look like. So we have upper crustal magma reservoir that's very close to the surface of the Earth uh, underneath here. Um, and it's very hot, and this is where we get our activity in Yellowstone. Our resurgent domes are kind of here. You can see Sour Creek Dome, Mallard Lake Dome. This is the place where the plume is coming up uh, underneath the caldera there. Okay, um, so another thing that is interesting about these hot springs, uh, so each one of these is a hot spring, again, and these, uh, Open circles are no photosynthesis occurring at that location, and these uh, black dots are photosynthesis occurring at that location. I'll show you a picture of what I mean by that at this time. And so this was from my honors thesis, it ended up getting published way later, uh, but basically there's a range for where photosynthesis is occurring in these hot springs. And we know that the upper temperature limit is about 74 degrees Celsius, but as we decrease the pH here, the upper temperature limit has decreased. And we're not quite sure why that is. And people don't actually know the mechanism for why this limit even exists. You can read in the literature and there's like, oh yeah, so thermal stability of enzymes and membranes and all that at this, but no one's ever actually shown this. Um, so we actually have a grant from NASA to actually pursue uh, that transition because it's important in terms of life on Earth and what happened on our planet with cyanobacteria two billion years ago. So what is microbial photosynthesis? Let's look at this hot spring. Here it is, it's, uh, it's close to 90 and it comes out, 90 Celsius, pH is eight, comes out here and it's cooling down in this channel. So we get cooling down of the water, we'll have precipitation of silica, we'll have input of dissolved oxygen as we are exposing this to air, and we have changes in chemistry. So we continue down this outflow channel and then this is what I mean by microbial photosynthesis. So here it is. Uh, this is bison pool, it's in Sentinel Meadow, and this line is at 67 Celsius. So the upper temperature limit is 74, but here it's 67. 
I think it's because there's a little bit of sulfide uh, in this water that may be pushing that down a little bit, but we'll see about that. So this right here is where the photosynthesis is occurring. Here there isn't photosynthesis, and you can see this line when you walk up to a spring. Down here at 64, a pH of 8.2 at that point. Okay, so back to this. So you saw a picture of this, but it was from right over here, looking this way a little bit, but it looked very, very different. So in July 2015, we have this mud pot, and in May 2016, it looked like this. So we have a very dynamic change from this large bubbling mud pot to, okay, it's kind of sizzling in different areas and different sources of steam are coming up. And so Georgia, Dahlquist here, is very interested in what is happening uh, in these mud pots. So why is their chemistry the way that it is and how does it compare to a hot spring you know, that is right next to it, for example? Uh, the general feeling is that the alkaline springs are alkaline chloride springs. The water is deeply sourced, it comes up. And then acidic springs are when you get separation with steam at depth, the steam comes up. Um, and you get uh, reactions with uh, H2S to get sulfuric acid, uh, giving you these acid springs. And so Georgia is interested in what's happening with the calcium and the lanthanum, um, so the rare earths uh, in these mud pots. There aren't a lot of data actually on dissolved chemistry of mud pots. Uh, there's a bunch of data on uh, mineralogy of mud pots, and there's a little bit of microbiological data, but Georgia is trying to link all this stuff together. Um, comparing uh, calcium concentrations to rare earth concentrations um, in these mud pots. Another interesting thing that um, has happened in some of these mud pots is they actually recently found an enzyme from an organism in a mud pot that contains um, a rare earth element as in that enzyme, which has never been shown before. So interesting chemistry of life happening in mud pots and Georgia is on it. Here she is with her filtration setup. So she has her different her pre-filter here with the mud, and then the, it goes through our, our usual filtering kit. All right. So flooded mine shaft. So we're moving away from the super volcano to locally in town. Um, here are our legend sampling down uh, in the mine shaft. So this is from uh, Renee. And, and her work locally in the mines that we do in coordination with the Bureau. So they come out with us and we get to sample with them, which is awesome. And Renee uh, has been sampling like these nine locations. And from Chris's work, we know that there's a variety of chemistry as we go across um, town, right? So closer to the Berkeley pit, we have uh, more acidic waters and it's less as we go this way. This is the groundwater divide that Chris has um, labeled. Um, so let's look at some of the water chemistry that we see in these three mines here. So metals. We've got the, the Kelly mine. So this is millimolar uh, on the y-axis. Uh, so this is zone one, closer to the pit, uh, acidic. And the pH is 4.65 here. And this is what we see in terms of concentrations of some of our metals in there. So high concentrations of iron. Uh, so zone two, we move out a little bit, so slightly uh, more towards neutral. And the scale, we have to zoom in here because the Kelly mine has so much iron in it. So let's zoom out to look at this in millimolar scale. And so the Anselmo and the Steward uh, have lower amounts of metals, and we have that change in pH here. Um, which metals are, have we been looking at? So here's our periodic table. We've been looking at transition metals, aluminum and, our, and arsenic as a metalloid. Uh, Renee has been looking into the GWIC data with help from Gary Ecopini. And this is the, these are the Bureau data over time, starting in 1985 and coming on uh, towards the present in terms of arsenic. So this is micromole per liter. And so the Anselmo arsenic concentrations have changed over time uh, in the Anselmo. So Renee is currently working on uh, her microbiological extractions for DNA so that we can actually see what organisms are down there hanging out, um, performing reactions in these flooded mine environments. Okay, so moving from the mines 
out to the surface water. Okay, so we've been looking at the Silverbow and Blacktail Creeks as headwaters of the Clark Fork. And what we want to do is we want to figure out, so what organisms and diversity of them do we have in Silverbow Creek? Uh, is that normal? Is that not normal? It's probably not going to be normal. And so we picked five locations and we've been um, sampling them regularly since last, we started last November. Uh, and we're going to see what is, how healthy the ecosystem is um, in Silverbow Creek and how does that change with the seasons. Uh, we're also going to look at microbial activity. We haven't gotten that far yet. We're still in this phase of extracting DNA from these. And then we will integrate what we find with the microbes with the new geochemical data that we have as well as the large wealth of information that we have about Silverbow Creek uh, to see what is happening. Okay, so we have to consider the microbes because they're a vital part of our healthy, of a healthy ecosystem and they can change as the ecosystem changes as well. Okay, um, so in terms of Silverbow Creek, one way to go about figuring out what's there, um, you can count and see some organisms that you've had there under a microscope, as well as you can culture organisms and see what you get. But now we can get the microbial community by just extracting all of that DNA and figure out what is there. So we are in the process of doing this right now to monitor how healthy. I think Jordan has a whole bunch of uh, DNA extracted and we have done PCR on some of it and then we will get sequence data when we send that off and get it returned to us. So we have five sites that we do in town uh, and our control is kind of up at nine mile, our pseudo sort of control. And so, so far we've sampled November, February, uh, May, and then just this August to get our base flow. Um, yeah, the first time we sampled was last November and we kind of missed the base uh, flow there. So that's what we've been working on um, in town as well as uh, the Upper Clark Fork, we started sampling uh, in May. So we have all the way down to Drummond data from May and August. All right, so this is from February sampling. This is Upper Silverbow Creek here, and here's Jordan collecting a sample from Silverbow at Montana Street. Okay, and so one of the things that we're uh, doing with the data, so this is a program databasing. It's kind of, it's like ArcGIS, but it is um, a fairly user-friendly interface. Uh, we've been working on it. And basically, you can put your data into this and then look at it spatially as well as with time. So here, Jordan has put the aluminum data into databasing. And basically, the higher, the hotter the colors, the higher the aluminum that we see at our points down here. Um, and it's about a micromolar mole out, so 30 nanomole out here. So if we think of PPB, it's about 30 to 1 PPB in general here. And so we just started kind of using this recently. And so we're going to be able to do um, kind of analyses of changes with time uh, and kind of see those changes as we go down. So high inputs of aluminum might be here, and the lower are these cooler, cooler colors. So we just started delving into uh, looking at our data spatially, which is going to really help us. Okay, so another project that we've been working on uh, in Legend is our hyperaccumulating native plants, um, and we're thinking about this like towards phytoremediation in the future. And so we did this this summer as a surf project. Uh, Jeremy McKenzie and Robert and I were working on this project. And here we are at the, at the Trevona Mine Yard, um, analyzing what is happening in this one meter by one meter square soil. So we took the data from the old reports in 88 of lead and arsenic in soils around town. And so these are some of the places. We didn't sample all of these places. This is the map that we started with. And so we ended up picking some sites over here and over here and over here. I'm gonna look a little bit more closely at some of those sites. So the Travona is one that we'll look at. And basically, we went out to the sites and we found an area that was disturbed in there and an area that was worked on, starting to be reclaimed there. And we measured the pH of the soil, so 6.1 and 8.3. And we took our one meter by one meter square grid to figure out what, uh, what sort of uh, background we have for the soil as well as what plants are around. 
And so we did a species list and relative abundance. We did a percent cover in a one meter by one meter square grid, kind of percent composition, measured the soil, and collected a plant for analysis. So here's Mackenzie. So she collected her plant, and it's going to be divided and put into containers for analysis back in the lab for the soil we're going to analyze, the roots, and the, um, and the leaves and stems. So we're going to see what the soil is in the environment that the plant is living in. We're going to see where is the metal going into the plant. Is it the roots or is it the leaves? Um, and compare what is happening with that. So here's Mackenzie collecting her plants into her clean containers. All right, and these are some of, of uh, our results in terms of that. So uh, this is the percentage of what is happening on the, in there, like rock, cobble, pebble, vegetative soil. And in each location, we did a disturbed and a reclaimed site. So we're, this is a work in progress. And these are the pH values that we measured in the soil at each one of these uh, different locations uh, around town. So we were looking at the Travona. We saw the pictures of the Travona here. And so this work is ongoing. Uh, we have all the samples, and we're going to acid digest them and analyze them for metals uh, soon. So we have that all set up now that the air is back on in the building. We can do our work. OK, so today we kind of talked about some different environments ranging from the super volcano in our backyard uh, all the way to uh, what our water system is doing because of uh, the mine, flooded mine water that we have. And so we're trying to figure out how is the water interacting with the rocks in that area, and how are the microbes interacting with the water that we get from the rocks. And so eventually we'll be able to link microbial activity, what, what is happening with that microbe with the geochemistry uh, in these sorts of different environments. Okay, and here are people that are doing all of this work uh, in the lab. So we have our master's students, Georgia and Renee. Recently, Shanna, Mallory, and James have joined the lab just this year, so we'll get them started on something interesting. And Jordan and Mackenzie have been working with me all year, and undergraduate Cynthia has just joined our lab for this year. So more good work to come. And I need to thank everybody that's been helping me out. This is not an all-inclusive list. This is just a start. So uh, we've got Joe, Steve, Chris, Anna, Mark, Robert, Joe, everyone at the Bureau, Ted, Gary, Mitt, Jeremy, and Jackie and Ashley analyze our samples for us. Very timely and very helpful. Uh, we work with Jerry Downey as well. And then some of the data you saw towards the beginning were from my postdoc work, so with uh, Everett Schock and the GeoPig group at Arizona State. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, so funding, um, gotten funding from, from tech for faculty seed development, undergrad research program, and a little bit of startup um, in the summer surf program. Our Upper Clark Fork project is funded by the Montana Water Center. Uh, we have a project with uh, Jerry Downey on nanoparticles cleaned for cleaning water from the Montana University system. Um, Jordan has gotten a fellowship from uh, EPSCoR for the summer. And the microbial photosynthesis project that was recently funded by NASA. So we'll be using that to get protein extractions done and try to figure out why those organisms are occurring where they occur in those hot springs. And with that, I will take any questions that you have. No question. Colleen, yes. We'll find out when we acid digest them and then see what those concentrations are. So, um, so different types of plants store things in different places. Um, and Robert there can uh, help us with that uh, a little bit more. But we're going to see the particular native plants that we have in this area. And so we'll see from ICPMS data you know, if it's higher in the root or if it's higher in the leaves. And we just had that greenhouse experiment that we... Oh, yeah, I didn't talk about the greenhouse experiment. Oh, yeah, so um, we have a greenhouse experiment that was set up, and now the plants are ready. And so we are going to expose them to three different levels of arsenic and lead and see how they cope over a certain amount of time and then measure their metal uptake uh, using acid digestion and ICPMS as well. So, yeah, no, that's... 
exciting and we're about ready to get to it because the plants have been growing for a couple months now. Two months, yeah. So they're ready. So. so uh, yes, Doug. I found the uh, uh, graph you put up there on the arsenic levels in yeah. in Selmo. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Strange, maybe take your pick. Um, in fact, it, the fact that they were zero for a long time and then all of a sudden they were all over the map. I don't know if that has to do with an analytical thing or not. At the well, that's my question. <laughs> is that, yeah. it, and it, that doesn't really look like a natural process no. to me. No. Uh, does anybody in some of the, and I guess that was Bureau of Data, is anybody? It's Bureau of Data, data. we should ask the Bureau. <clears throat> No comments. I would just say that I know they got a big upgrade on their ICP MS. Was that year? In some year. In some year. In some year. I mean, it could be one. Yeah, but it could be one. The thing is that um, these waters have to be diluted down before we can put them in the ICP. And, and so, um, you know, they're pushing their limit detection, limit, detection yeah. back in the 90s, you know. Yeah, no, this is. a better is... instrument, so maybe, maybe that's part of it. But, but, I am not sure. So, something good to look into. When I look at data like these, I think, like I think, analytical limit is the first thing that I think about. Yeah. Usually. <laughs> yeah. Line yep. Yep. I, I was also wondering if there are variations in the depth of the sample, rising water level. I'm wondering if there's much right. difference. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so each of those data points, Renee, probably have a depth associated with them. Yeah. Um, so. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> so on the graph, where you see kind of the two points on top of each other? Like, like here. Yeah. yeah, so like here and here and here, those were duplicates that were taken. Um, and then they were at different depths. So the graph is all incorporated. It's not um, just at one depth. Water standard and yeah, that's PPV and yeah. Um, so micromole is PPM, so we'd have to multiply by. It. Right. Yes, I understand that. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I don't remember what it is, um, <laughs> what the EPA limit for arsenic is in micromolel, so, but it's, yeah, it's lower than that by quite a bit, but I don't remember exactly what it is um, in micromolel. Yeah. It's 10 parts per billion. It's 10 yeah. That's why that. Okay. Multiply it in the head. Yes. Do you know that you were talking about the uh, photosynthesis in Yellowstone and you saw different regions for photosynthesis? Yeah. Do you know how many species or who is adding to that photosynthesis? Yeah. Is it a data that is. Yeah, so those sorts of data are now available. And um, so Basically, uh, there are, so cyanobacteria only occur down to a pH of like three or four-ish, so the limit of where cyanobacteria occur is 
uh, in question. And low, the eukaryotic organisms tend to be the photosynthesis that is occurring at the lower pH values. Like so algae. Yeah, so there's cyanidium is one, and then there are other types of algae that are acidic, that are at those environments, yeah. And then the cyanobacteria are at the more basic, um, at the higher levels. And so we do see a little bit of that of separation by species. <coughs> yes. Yes. Why is there a white Um, so, I don't know what the lower, like you can find life in very acidic waters. Maybe this is a question for, let's see, Brian back there. Do you know the lower pH limit for life on Earth? It's zero. Like, yeah, they found things all the way pretty low. So, so no lime. <laughs> so, I'm sure there's stuff like even growing in Rio Tinto that are acidophiles. So, I don't know why that there's a... Yeah. Well, that's just the way that I plotted it to zero. Things can live in all sorts of wild environments. You, you said, yes, Chris. And I think you said in this slide that um, people are thinking these hot alkaline areas might be where life forms. Yeah, the serpentinizing and, and ideas. Why, why is it better to be alkaline for that? Um, about that high Yeah, so. So there are different ideas as to why uh, the alkaline is better than acidic. And um, it basically has to do with uh, some of the, the reactions that occur um, there. And, but the other thing, um, you know, I think the jury's still out on you know, whether or not it was alkaline or acidic. And I know that some people have been looking into uh, the acidic environments, but when they look at all of the genomes that we have for organisms today, the things that are more deeply rooted tend to like not be the acidic ones, so therefore they, they're leading towards it being a more alkaline environment. So I don't know that that necessarily answers your question, but, um, but people have looked into these serpentinizing environments like the Lost City vent and these Oman vents, and they think that it, that it works. Uh, geochemically, like, and energetically, it's kind of hard to be neutral a little bit, like, oh, yeah. things occurring at neutral, so, yeah. More questions? Okay. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs>